Whilst it's certainly dated now, the original 1996 Resident Evil upon release terrified your average gamer. It was new, mysterious and presented a great unknown. Playing as either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, players were separated from their teammates in a gigantic spooky mansion that was one part scary in its empty abandoned state and one part scary in the fact that it wasn't abandoned enough. Lurking anywhere could be zombies waiting to take a bite out of you, or something much worse. Furthermore, the presentation cemented Resident Evil as gaming's biggest AAA horror title to that point, and chiefly, the music set the scene. The impactful scores of RE games would go on to be a staple for years to come, and whilst I didn't start with the original, in my first experiences with the series as a child, I would mute Resident Evil 2 because the sound design creeped me out so much. What was that? But there's one game from the classic era that really sticks out. This is Sci for First Aid Spray, and this is the true story of Resident Evil Director's Cut Jewel Shock. Resident Evil was a resounding success. It looked great, it played great, it sounded great, and it was something fresh for the market to all look towards. Capcom would have been insane not to commission a sequel, and they knew it. They immediately set out to outlining Resident Evil 2, however their choice for director in Shinji Mikami, like the T-Virus carrying zombies themselves, would come back to bite them. Mikami was initially very hesitant to make a follow-up, which is pretty true of the guy's work ethic in general. Even today, with the exception of Resident Evil 4, he's never worked as director on any sequel game. Nonetheless, discussing what a sequel to Resident Evil would entail would take time, and Capcom wanted to strike whilst the iron was hot. A year and a half later, in September 1997, Resident Evil would return to the PlayStation with the Director's Cut Edition. This let gamers play that first adventure again, but with remixed enemy and item locations, extra costumes, and so on. It also served to tie their audience over whilst Capcom diligently worked on Resident Evil 2, which had been close to being finished before it was scrapped in the summer of that year and the team went back to square one. However, Director's Cut was somewhat unfortunately timed itself, as it hit shelves just a month after Sony released the original DualShock controller. Capcom elected to also work on a third version of Resident Evil 1 that would be compatible with the device that would go on to shape the console's identity, but they also wanted to offer something else for fans to separate the second Director's Cut from the first. And thus, Director's Cut DualShock version released in Japan and the USA about a year later in the fall of 1998 with a brand new soundtrack. The new score for Resident Evil DualShock was credited to Mamoru Samuraguchi, a man who had become somewhat of a cultural phenomenon at the time. He was often referred to as the Japanese Beethoven or the Digital Beethoven on account of the fact that he was deaf. Like Beethoven, Samuraguchi had a rare ability called Absolute Pitch, which meant that he could hear any note perfectly in his head. This is how both he and Beethoven wrote the music that they did, despite never hearing it outside of their own imagination. Samuraguchi was making waves in the late 90s after scoring for the TV film Remembering the Cosmos Flower, and Capcom opted to capitalise on all the talk. When Resident Evil DualShock was released, the new soundtrack was met with pretty mixed reactions. Some of the music was fine in theory, and most people these days don't even realise that several pieces are actually pretty good. Some are actually really good, which is why I personally have used a few of them in our videos so far on the channel. Some are a bit messy in places, and some feel more akin to something like Final Fantasy or even Castlevania than to survival horror, but several of the major pieces really do feel like Resident Evil. I'd suggest taking a real look through the score if you never have, since many tracks are overlooked, but then again, they are standing in one gigantic black shadow. <laughs> Yes, the mansion basement theme, sometimes referred to as clowns farting in a basement, or tripping over alligators, or the Charlie Brown talking sound effect brigade. That one's not real, but you can't deny it. Oh, good grief. Nobody quite understood this anomaly then, and nobody quite understands it now. Since its unveiling in 1998, it's been the butt of many a joke, and that holds strong today. But in the words of Barry Burton, What is this? 
You can't claim it was because of Samuro Gochi's deafness, because the quality of his previous compositions holds strong, and again you'd be wide of the mark for assuming that he just didn't quite understand what sounds best on the system he was working with. After all, composing for a PlayStation sound chip is very different than a real orchestra, but if that's the case then why does the rest of the score sound competent? Most likely the answer is closer to the latter, some kind of bizarre mistake perhaps, and many fans have tried to reinterpret what perhaps this song was meant to sound like, some to decent levels of success. Regardless, the mansion basement has gone on to be immortalised as one of the worst pieces of video game music of all time, but it doesn't remotely end there. In 2001, Samuro Gochi would work again with Capcom on the soundtrack for Onimusha Warlords, which was universally praised, and then over the next decade he would continue to compose. By the end of the noughties, his star was still rising. In 2013, he was the focus of a TV documentary called Melody of the Soul, the composer who lost his hearing, and a piece of music he composed was selected to represent Japan in the figure skating event of the 2014 Winter Olympics. However, this would cause a particular man to step out of the shadows who would change everything. For a few years there'd been doubts about Samuragochi's legitimacy, claims of plagiarism and unpublished articles that cast aspersions on his condition, but it was about to be blown wide open. In February 2014, school music teacher Takashi Nagaki revealed in a TV press conference that Mamoru Samuragochi had spent his entire career lying. The man was not a composer, and Nagaki explained that he'd been paid to ghostwrite all of Samuragochi's works. Moreover, Samuragochi was not deaf. The image of the Japanese Beethoven was shattered. It all been an act, orchestrated by Mamoru in order to grow a mystique around him and his work. Samaragochi was ruined, and quite rightfully had all kinds of awards taken from him, including his name being accredited to the upcoming Winter Olympic dance. Nagaki similarly felt it prudent to resign from his position as music teacher, however he was praised by the public for his work, and has gone on as a composer in his own right, this time with his own name. Which now, retroactively means that Samaragochi's work is recognised rightfully as Nagaki's, the composer of Remembering the Cosmos Flower, Onomusha, and Resident Evil Director's Cut Dual Shock. In Capcom, choosing to employ the up and coming charisma of Samuro Gochi, they wound up in some small way a part of history, a cultural moment in Japanese classical music to be forever more referenced as a national scandal. So, that's the story of the Dual Shock soundtrack as we know it. There are still a few loose threads, admittedly, and one day we can only hope that Nagaki explains his thought process behind what is one of the most significant pieces of Resident Evil music, if not for all the wrong reasons. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more Resident Evil content of all kinds. This is Sai for First Aid Spray, and have a good week.